lovely job. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. And um, yeah, so thanks ever so much for inviting me along. And um, it would be lovely to be with you all in person. Um, but I'm well aware that the germs currently prevent that happening, and um, which I'm quite pleased about in some respects. So anyway, I'm going to tell you about um, the Moth Atlas and how we put it together. And, um, and it's been quite a mission, actually. And I'm glad that we finally made it. So we announced plans to do the um, an atlas of Britain and Ireland's larger moths in January 2014. So that's like seven years ago now. And um, a lot of endurance was required. And unlike Shackleton's ship of the same name, we weren't crushed under the pressure. And we managed to achieve um, the production of the moth atlas. During the whole process, I discovered that Atlas apparently was the god of endurance and, um, you know, carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. And it certainly felt that way during the process. And as with all epic journeys, <clears throat> there are highs and lows and losses and gains. And we met lots of interesting characters along the way. And basically, our lives are in, in this book. So like all good project managers, you have a project plan and a timeline. Well, we drew up several timelines. And as you can see, with all the different annotations on there, um, things slipped a bit and things were changed and things moved along slower or faster. And in the end, I, uh, I gave up with the project plan and just decided it would get done when it got done. And, um, and the, according to Einstein, the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. And as I said, we finally got there and I'm going to tell you how we did it. There was about 11 of us working on the project on and off over a period of, of uh, five years. And um, and this is the this is the uh, lovely cover that we that we got. And one of the first problems that well, one of the first jobs that we did was source images. We needed stunning images of moths on appropriate backgrounds with their legs in the right positions in the, you know, the stand, you know, normal form of the moth. And uh, the images needed to be striking and of high resolution. And it was quite tricky for some species like the Ascent Gem, of which there's only two British records. So we needed to source a, a photograph from, from overseas and our colleague um, Wolfgang Wagner provided an image of the Ascent, Ascent gem. Then we also had um, the Minsmere Crimson Underwing. There was only one British record. And, uh, and so again, we had to go to Wolfgang in, in Germany to get an image of this absolutely cracking moth. But some of the more common and widespread moths were quite tricky to get photographs of, for example, the heart and dart. So, I mean, I would personally, I would consider this moth to be a mother's moth. It's quite, quite brown. It's not very striking. It's not very attractive to, you know, the a normal sort of, you know, everyday person. And it was tricky to get pictures of this one. Um, and maybe it is because it is a, a, a mother's moth and people don't really think it's worthy of a, a photo shoot. But thanks to our very own um, Mark Parsons, we sourced that one. Um, but then also the Scarlet Tiger. I mean, the Scarlet Tiger is a moth that could give any any uh, butterfly a run for its money in the beauty stakes and, you know, could quite easily be on the front cover of Vogue. But this is also one that we, we struggled to get an image of. But we got there in the end. And, uh, th and thanks, many thanks to all of the photographers who contributed their photographs to the Atlas completely free of charge. It's much, much appreciated. One of the next things we needed to do was raise funds to uh, for the Atlas, you know, for the production of the Atlas. And so we ran an eBay style moth auction on a site called Jumble Bee and people could bid for their favourite species. And in some cases there were bidding wars. And, um, you know, you could go on there and, and place a bid and then you'd find, oh, I've been outbid. So you bid again. And as I said, there were bidding wars going on. And um, um, but once you won your moth, once the, the, the uh, auction came to an end and you were the you know, you were the, the, the one that put the most money up and you sponsored that particular species, you could have a personal dedication on the uh, on the uh, in the species account. And um, over 400 uh, people sponsored moths for the moth atlas and again many thanks to, to you all and I know Yorkshire branch of butterfly conservation sponsored several moths. 
And, um, and it was the first time that Butterfly Conservation had ever tried anything like this to raise funds. And actually this novel idea, a novel initiative was really, really successful. We also received funding from, <clears throat> from corporate sponsors and, and, uh, and grant, grant giving trusts. So Anglian Lepidoptera Supplies, Green Wings, Holidays, Habitat Aid, Nature Trek and Nature's Way Foods. Nature's Way Foods, actually, that was quite a cheeky, uh, a cheeky ask on my front. They got in touch about uh, silver wine moths and that, was there an influx? Because some of their food producers were saying that they'd seen lots of uh, silver wise. And I said, well, while you're at it, do you fancy sponsoring the Moth Atlas? And, and they went for it, which was absolutely fantastic. So it just goes to show, unless you ask, you don't get. So, um, and Beds and North Hants branch of Butterfly Conservation uh, donated quite a lot of money as well, as did the Cecil Pilkington Charitable Trust, the Gatliff Trust, the Robert Kiln Charitable Trust, and the World Heart Trust. So um, it's absolutely fantastic. So again, thanks to all the, uh, the sponsors and the corporates that aided the fundraising for the Moth Atlas. <clears throat> and there's a lovely little December moth given us all the eye. <clears throat> so having got the photographs and, uh, and, and raised some money, we then needed to source the data. So the data came from the National Moth Recording Scheme, which is Butterfly Conservation Scheme, and it covers the UK, the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands. And as we wanted to include the whole island, island of Ireland, we also approached Moths Ireland and, uh, and they submitted their data set as well. Um, so we could have full coverage of, of Britain and Ireland. <clears throat> so with all this data, 25.6 million records, um, we had lots of data to check. And the first thing, one of the first things we did with this was check the um, validity of the data and produce, we produced provisional uh, provisional app, provisional ma distribution maps of species. <clears throat> and here's the uh, map of the green carpet here. And the, the maps have three different date classes on there. So the yellow dots are pre-1970, the blue dots are 1970 to 1999, and the red and the black dots are um, for 2000 onwards. <clears throat> So what, we'd, what we did with all these maps is we produced all these maps and then sent them to a panel of experts and um, for scrutiny. So this included, uh, you know, county moth recorders and other eminent mothers. And also we did some uh, within BC as well. So the maps are all scrutinized and, uh, and we did find that there were some dodgy records or potentially dodgy records. So about 10,000 possible dubious records were, were, were found. Um, these, this is for, four, for 482 species. And these queries were all referred back to the county moth recorders and we got a 50% response rate. Four and a half thousand of these records were retained because there was evidence and the county recorder was sure that they were correct. Um, 3,000 records we didn't have a response for and two and a half thousand records were rejected by county moth recorders. So they were like, oh, crikey, on a second look, actually, no, we, I need to, uh, need to chuck that one out. And we also chased up missing records for at least 80 species. Another sort of verification, an extra level of verification that we did was um, to investigate or do provisional phenology charts for species and to look for potential dodgy dates. And as you can see here with this lime hawk moth uh, phenology chart, we've got the historical data from 1970 to 1979 in the purple and the black bars show the <clears throat> more recent data from 2000 to 2016. And you can see um, with these little red, red areas, I'm just gonna see if I can get a pointer here, uh, laser pointer, there we are. These, here we are, these, uh, these records down here, they're outside of the main flight chart, as are these, these up the main flight period, as are these later ones here. So we needed to um, investigate these, uh, which is what we did. So, and the investigation of these phenology charts, we found that, um, we found that there are about 12,000 records for 587 species that were poten had potentially dodgy dots. Um, but some of these, about 4,000 records um, had 
the problem was due to Excel date formatting. So Excel, in its wisdom, for whatever reason, changes some dates to uh, some numbers to 1905. It's a serial number. And also some of the dates were in American date format. So about a third of the records had this particular issue. And we also found that there were life stage and sampling method mismatches. And 6,000 records had this life stage sampling method mismatches. And if you look at this one here, so December moth here, we've got um, on the 23rd of May 2014, apparently 30 adults were, were, uh, were seen. Um, but then it was the, but then we discovered that it was bred ex pupae. So really this record, the records for these December moths should have perhaps had that they have said that they were larval records and had the, the, sort of the larval the larval date in there as opposed to and um, you know as, a, as opposed to them being recorded as adults. And again, we've got had a similar issue with Welsh clearwing. I mean these aren't the two only two species, but these are just two examples. Welsh clearwing on the uh, 8th of September 2002, one count of adult, oh, but actually it's a cocoon. So um, anyway, so these were reasonably easy to, uh, to remedy and sort out. Um, so it sounds like there was an awful lot of, uh, of, of errors, but really when you think about it and put it in perspective, 12,000 out of 25 million records um, that were potentially erroneous, had erroneous dates, equates to 0.05%. Um, and about 10,000 records out of 25 million um, had potentially dodgy distribution dots. So that's 0.04%. Add those up and it's only 0.09%. Uh, so that's only 0.01% more errors than pesky species of clothes moths. And this pesky species of clothes moths uh, figure is one of my favourites for quoting to the media when they say that all moths eat clothes. Um, so yeah, so to put it in perspective, the, the error rate was actually very low, but when you're dealing with masses of data, it can seem quite overwhelming. So, so we got there in the end. We've got all the all the all the all the all the dodgy dates were were cleaned and all the dodgy dots were were, were remedied, and um, and using data from the National Moth Recording Scheme and Moths Island, we have produced the Moth Atlas with which features 893 macro moth species. 867 of those have actually got a species account. We've got 26 species in the appendix. Um, so these are species that haven't been recorded since 1969. They're sort of like former residents or ex gone extinct. And then there's also another appendix in there which uh, includes all the aggregates. So here we are, here's a, I'm not sure how many of you have got a copy of the Moth Atlas, but um, this just shows an example of a species account. So here we are, we have an absolutely cracking photograph with the photographer acknowledged down the side the ABH number and the Bradley and Fletcher number. Um, they've got the distribution map here. And then we've got this shows, these little boxes here show the number of 10 kilometer squares that the species was recorded in, in all the different um, date classes. And we've got that for Britain and also for Ireland separately. Um, we've also got the um, distribution, long-term distribution trend. So from 1970 to 2016, or from 1980 to 2016, or from 1990 to 2016. And then we've got the short-term distribution trend, which shows um, the trend distribution trend from 2000 to 2016. The Rothamsted insect survey data were used to generate abundance trends. And again, we've got those, most of them are from 1970 to 2016, although some of the pug species are from 1984, 1986. And then also we've got the red list status. So the GB red list status and the Irish red list status. Um, there's a little bit of blurb about the species. Um, and this mainly is an aid to interpretation of the novel information on the page. So for example, so the distribution map and also um, the, the phenology charts. We, we were really limited on space. We only wanted to have one volume of the Moth Atlas rather than two. So space was very limited. So we kept the text very concise. We had to, we had to work with something like 342 characters, including spaces. So it was a tough, tough going to, to keep them nice and neat and short. And, uh, 
and then as I said, we've got the, um, the you know, more novel information. We've got the flight chart on there as well. We had three different types of flight chart. Um, <clears throat> the majority of them were comparative flight charts comparing flight periods from the 19, 1970 to 1979 compared with 2000 to 2016. A few species we had what we call splattergrams um, and these are sort of like um, well, they, they, they show the density or the intensity of, of records for a particular species against latitude so some of those showed some really much more interesting um, showed much more interesting information than the standard phenology chart. And then last but not least, um, down in the bottom right underneath each of the maps is the uh, sponsorship information. So, so what, so the MOF Atlas, so to start going into the results, um, looking at recording intensity over time, um, we've got um, 25.6 million MOF records, uh, covering a period of 275 years. We've got 97% coverage at 10 kilometer square resolution. Uh, this chart up here on the right shows the um, increase in the number of records from 1960 to 2016. And you can see it just increases, increases, and, um, and it just you know, starts flying up from round about, I don't know, 2003, say. Um, and we think that a lot of that is due to um, digital technology, you know, computers and everything like that. Um, looking at the, um, the number of records for the different time periods, we can see that almost three quarters of records are, were collected in the, most, in the most recent time period, so 2000 to 2016, whereas there's only about 3% of them which we consider to be historical, so pre-1970. And, uh, and you think these, these guys here, I would imagine that they're pre-1970. And, uh, and you can see from the, their attire that the, the, the moth recorder attire has moved on somewhat, and as has the uh, moth trapping technology as well. But these two are absolute trailblazers, and I'm quite sure that there's some of their records in the moth atlas. So focusing on records from the modern period, so that's in 2000 to 2016, there's 18.7 million moth records um, for, for there. The map on the right there shows the, um, in the, the density of records at 10 kilometer square resolution. The darker the color, the more records for that 10K square. And you can see as you move northwards up the country, um, up the, U the UK, that the, the number of records sort of reduces further north. Um, in some of this is, is due, well, it's due to, particularly in Scotland, it's due to uh, uh, less po human population density and also fewer fewer species as well. Um, and you can what you can see what we found here was that um, SV ninety one on the Isles of Scilly was the most was the rec was the uh, was the ten k square with the greatest number of records, almost one hundred and eighty five thousand, and T twenty nine in County Wicklow had just shy of 45,000 records. And I do believe that that's the 10 kilometer square where the, uh, where the, the, the chap that established Moths Ireland uh, lives. So no surprises there, he's obviously very keen. Um, and then looking at species density, so there's 893 species um, included in the Moth Atlas, 761 of them are considered to be resident somewhere in the British Isles. And again, the map on the right shows um, the darker the colour, the greater number of species recorded. And again, as you move further north, um, there's fewer species recorded. And TRO2 in Kent had the greatest number of species recorded, so 548 and T29 in County Wicklow, again, where the county used the, the, the founder of Moths Island lives, um, had 369 species. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to produce robust distribution trends for um, the Atlas using National Moth Recording Scheme data. But the National Moth Recording Scheme data aren't collected in a standardized, with any standardized methodology. Some people run their traps all night, some people don't. The weather can make a difference. Um, 
all, all sorts of things can can you know can influence that as as can um, recording intensity. And basically, the National Moth Recording Scheme is what I would consider to be a Cinzano scheme. It's any moth, any time, anywhere. Apologies for you young ones who don't know what Cinzano is. Um, anyway, um, so anyway, so with this, um, with this, there's, there can be temporal and spatial bias in the data. But fortunately, statistical methodology has moved on quite a lot and a, uh, um, and a technique called occupancy modelling um, can deal with all of this uh, temporal and spatial bias and, and take that into account when it's generating the trends. So we managed to produce robust distribution trends for Great Britain at one kilometre square resolution. Um, we didn't, we ran trend, we ran the uh, occupancy modelling on the Irish data, but unfortunately at this point in time, there wasn't enough of it to produce robust trends but as moth recordings growing in, in in popularity then it won't be too far down the line and we'll be able to do produce trends for for Ireland as well so we produced long-term trends um, for 500 and 511 species and aggregates and what we considered to be a long-term trend was either from 1970 to 2016 1980 to 2016 or 1990 to 2016 and we also generated um, trends for species for 559 species and their aggregates in the short term so the short term spanning 16 years from 2000 to 2016. So what did we find well What's this? Yeah. So, um, so we took the stand, we standardised it and took the long-term uh, distribution trends from 1970. So, 390 species had sufficient data for this 47-year period, and what we found was that 42% of species declined in distribution, whereas 58% of species increased in distribution. And so the biggest loser was the white colon, and that declined by 94% um, over the time period. Um, whereas the biggest winner was the red green carpet, and that increased by 667% over the time period. And for those 390 species that we, that we generated trends for, we found that 121 of them showed significant declines, so statistically significant declines, and 46 of those species declined by at least 50%. So this graph here, we've got the number of species on the y-axis and the distribution trend on the x-axis. And here's zero, so anything to the left of the zero um, shows declines, and it's the darker bars that are the statistically significant ones. Um, whereas on the other side, we've got 58% of species increasing, but um, only 38% of them showed significant increases and 36 of those species more than doubled. So again, the darker bars show the st statistically significant uh, data. And we found that almost a third of species showed no significant change. So let's just look at a couple of, of uh, examples here of species distribution changes. So here we have the beautiful hook tip. And uh, this moth is moving northwards and has now ventured into Yorkshire. And I had it written down here somewhere. Um, the first of the very coronet, the f oh no, I was talking about the wrong moth. So, <laughs> so anyway, so the, but the beautiful hook tip is now um, present in, in, in Yorkshire and is expanding northwards. Um, Cause you can see all these little black dots from 2000 onwards here where there were previously none or very few records and this moth the trend has increased by 31 percent from 1970 to 2016 and then we've also got the lappet there so no recent records for the lappet in yorkshire the moth was always um very rare and and and, and local in yorkshire and the last record was in 19 86 and this moth has declined by 61% across Great Britain from 1980 to 2016. 
and it's a beautiful moth. I've never seen one um, in real life at all, um, but I just find this this map so depressing. When you just look, the moth has been lost from huge, you know, huge areas in uh, you know central and su su central and southeastern England and and East Anglia, and um, and it's yeah, it's just a very very depressing uh, map. Ah, but it's it's hanging on in you know in the far south and, and a few spots in the southwest. So we also included um, abundance trends using data collected from the Rothamsted Insect Survey Light Trap Network. So this is standardised trapping methodology. The traps run every night throughout the year and have run since I don't know the late night late nineteen sixties. And we used a statistical technique called generalized abundance index. And we managed to um, generate uh, trends for 427 macro moth species. So um, this, our colleagues at U the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology actually did the number crunching and Rothamsted research, um, <clears throat> Rothamsted research generated and, and provided us with the data. So again, we took the uh, 47 year period from 1970 to 2016, um, and we managed to get trends for 397 species. And the data shows that 62% of species declined in abundance and 38% of species increased in abundance. And the biggest loser was uh, the stout dart. Um, the last record for this moth in, in the UK was in 2007 in Norfolk, um, and it suffered a 100% decline since 1970. And we do believe that this moth is now extinct and it's gone extinct right under our noses, basically. And uh, But the biggest winner is the buff footman with a staggering almost 84, well, 84 and a half thousand percent increase in its abundance and uh, and many of the foot footman species show similar similar trends um, you know they are marching marching uh, northwards across the country so let's have a look so looking at um, so this this again so this is the 62 percent of species that have declined and 34 percent of those 34% uh, of the species showed significant declines and 108 of what those have declined by at least 50%. Um, and then on the right hand side of the chart with the blue, we've got the species that have increased and 11% um, of species showed significant increases and 35 of them had more than doubled. So we thought it'd be interesting as well to, to look at, um, you know, do a comparison of, of distribution trends and abundance trends. And so 351 species had long, both long-term distribution trends and abundance trends. Um, and the chart on the right, we've got the distribution trend on the y-axis and the log abundance trend on the x-axis. And what you can see here is that 94 species increased in both measures. Um, the, we haven't got the significance on here, but basically um, little red dots are, are species that are significant in, in both measures. And then, and we've got down here, 121% of species, 121 species declined in both measures. And again, you can see a lot of red dots in here that show that um, these are significant. What would be really interesting is to actually dig deeper into this and actually put some species names, I think, to, to some of these dots on there and, and look at the traits of these species and do some analysis to see if there's certain species of certain traits which are faring, faring better or, or worse than others. We also looked at um, the mean flight period, uh, well, changes in phenology, and we looked at the mean flight period um, for 405 single brooded species. This excluded um, winter flying moths because having, a, having data that covers two calendar years makes things a bit messy. And we compared flight periods for moths from 1970 to 1979. Um, with 2000 to 2016 data. And this is for Britain, 
Ireland and the Isle of Man. We excluded the Channel Islands from this particular analysis because of the, you know, because it's geographically it's closer to the continent than, than to the UK. And this chart here shows the number of species on the Y axis and the difference in days on the X axis. And this is sort of zero. And anything to the left of that line are species that are flying earlier. Um, and anything to the right of the dotted red line, uh, species are flying later. And on average, mean flight dates were 4.8 days earlier um, for the modern, uh, the modern date period. So from 2000 to 2016. And some of the uh, some of the, the the changes to phenology are quite staggering. So 81% of species are flying earlier, and 12 of those 12 of those species are flying at least two weeks earlier. For example, the grey birch. And you can see here this is the um, the flight chart for this this moth. And you can see here this is the modern period here, and it's peaking much earlier and tailing off a little bit earlier um, compared to the data from the 1970s. And then we've got 19% of species um, are flying later, and 13 of them are flying at least a week later. For example, the pink barred sallow. And again, you can see here the flight chart. So the purple is the historical data, and then the black bars <clears throat> is the more recent uh, time period. Now, this is quite a quick and dirty um, analysis on, 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 the, uh, on, on the phenology, and it's something that we want to delve into and investigate further. And again, it would be really interesting to, you know, look at this in comparison with, uh, you know, compared with the, you know, the species traits and everything. So there's so much more information. This is, we're just scratching the surface here and there's so much more we can delve into and, you know, to, to help us understand what's happening to our, our moths and why. So there's a lovely ele pink elephant hawk moth. That's my favourite moth because it's pink and green. And, uh, you know, and let's face it, that moth could entice any non-moth believer. Let's face it, it's absolutely beautiful, stunning little creature. So the moth atlas has sort of shown lots of uh, changes to our moth fauna. And so, you know, what is driving? What is driving this? Well, there's a potent cocktail of, of um, potent cocktail driving biodiversity change. And although studies for moths are few and far between, it's likely that um, the, the, the effects, the, the factors that are affecting biodiversity more widely are also impacting on our, on our moths. So, <clears throat> So land use change is perhaps one of the, the biggest um, the biggest factors. So we've lost about 90, 90 or over 90 percent of our flower rich grasslands, which provide you know, suitable habitat and, 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 and nectar sources and food plants and such like. And this has been converted to these lovely agricultural monocultures, which are drenched in chemicals and also has made way for, you know, for housing developments. And um, you know, for, for the you know our growing human population and our different lifestyles as well, and you know, second homes and things like that. So, um, so that's all. So that's the one of the biggest drivers is land use change. But some of these, uh, some species are benefiting from land use change. So, for example, um, the planting up of uh, conifer plantations has really benefited the spruce carpet. This moth has increased in distribution by 557% um, since 1970, and it's had an over 3,000% increase in abundance. And, um, and you can see here, if you look at the dots on this map, so again, very few historical records sort of further north, um, but you can see the modern records, the black dots, they're popping up all over the show and spreading all, all up through um, Yorkshire and, and Northern England into the borders and the central belt and as far, you know, up, up to him, up to the highlands. Uh, and then again, in, in, in uh, Northern uh, in Ireland as well, uh, the moth is, is, is spreading rapidly there. So, uh, so not all land use change is, is bad um, and some, some moths do, do do well. Um, and another example is the Blair shoulder knot that's had a 206% increase in distribution and a 
increase in abundance. And this is due to um, people's gardening habits and planting, um, planting non-native cypresses, for example, Leylandii and, and such like. Um, so again, that, that's been pretty beneficial, but there's a new craze. Oh, there we are, so I forgot. There's the map there that shows the, the distribution expansion of this species, again, all up through Northern England and then into, into, into Scotland and uh, into the central belt. And again, <clears throat> across into Ireland as well. Um, but there's a new craze and which is artificial grass and something like 800 hectares of land were covered in artificial grass from 2019 to 2020. Um, the market for artificial grass is growing and, um, and I think it's the next sort of scourge on our, on our gardens. Um, particularly, you know, our gardens are a real oasis for, 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 for moths, but not when you put this sterile plastic stuff down. Um, and in fact, artificial grass is so popular that you can find videos on YouTube on how to clean up bar, uh, tomato ketchup spillages after a, you know, after a barbecue. Um, you can vacuum your, um, you can vacuum your, your artificial grass. And there's also hints and tips on how to remove um, dog mess and, and the smell of uh, dog, you know, dog dog deposits from your from your artificial grass. So, like I said, it, it's it's uh, it's going to be the the next big uh, nemesis, I think. <clears throat> so, uh, so other things that influence our moths are changing land management out in the countryside. So, you know, a lot of land management in the countryside has become very intensive due to um, intensive agriculture. We research has shown that hedgerow trees are very beneficial for, for moths as are field margins. And, um, and also less intensively managed hedgerows um, are, you know, are refugia for moths. So, so there's plenty that can be done, but we just need the political will <clears throat> out there uh, and the, you know, and the farmers to get on board with, with, with that and obviously financial incentives to help farmers farm in a more environmentally friendly way to benefit moths, butterflies and all the other creatures that live out in the countryside. So... <clears throat> And changing, changing land management also encompasses um, livestock grazing as well. So, um, you know, rather than have so high, high intensity, high stocking densities of sheep, which mow the grass down to next to nothing, um, is, is detrimental to, to moths. Um, whereas if you have lower stocking densities, um, then less intensive, yeah, less intensive stocking densities is much more beneficial for moths. So, um, and, and cow grazing as well is 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 better than than uh, the sheep grazing. So, nitrogen pollution is also another factor that's influencing our our, our moths. Um, and it's not just a countryside issue or an urban issue. So, out in the countryside, we've got farmers putting loads of nitrogen on the on the on the fields and in the sit towns and cities we've got um, nitrogen deposition from the combustion of, of, of fossil fuels in in car engines and what we found what um, the researchers have found is that there's increased mortality in larvae for some species um, including the straw dot and the blood vein and there was an experiment done um, with nitrogen fertilizer applied to host plants at rates typically used in, in agriculture and, and it's shown to have detrimental effects on, on these moths. Um, because the thing is as well with the an increase in active nitrogen in soils changes this changes the soil chemistry and it changes the structure and the composition of, of plant communities and has knock-on effects to moths as well. Another issue is, um, is, is artificial light, light at night or light pollution. And this is a knock-on effect of, of urbanization. And not only does, um, does, does, does artificial lighting stop moths from getting on and doing what they need to do, like feed and breed, because they've all got disco fever around the lamps, um, but also, and they're, you know, and they're, they're, they're predated, predated they're, they're more vulnerable to predation as well around the lights but also um, artificial light at night has been shown to affect pheromone production in female cabbage moths 
Um, it's reduced larval growth in rustic shoulder knot caterpillars. And it also inhibits feeding in, uh, in, in, in adult moths, um, for example, the, in, for many species, including the common marbled carpet. And also there's a reduction in nocturnal pollination as well. Climate change is another biggie that's having a huge effect on our moths and, um, and it's affecting species range margins. So we've got here at the top, we've got the black arches. Um, the distribution trend for this moth has increased by 307% since uh, from 1970 to 2016. And again, the, the red-necked footman as well, 66% increase in distribution from 1990 to 2016. And what the research has shown is that the range margins of southern moths is expanding northwards um, at an accelerating rate. So, um, when they looked at data from 1966 to 1975 and compared it to the data from 1986 to 1995, species were moving at about 11 kilometres per decade. Add on a few more years, so you're looking at 1986 to 1995 data compared with the early 2000s, and species are rocketing up, you know, they've accelerated and they're now moving at about 31 kilometres per decade. Um, and there's also been some work done, they did a climate risk assessment and they found that um, more than 60% of the 422 moth species they studied could increase in their overall extent by 2099. However, um, there are lags due to habitat availability. So if you've got a, a, a species that's found down south, despite the fact that the climate is warming and there's potential for it to move northwards, if there's nowhere for it to live, there's nowhere for it to go, then that's, that's going to in, inhibit that, um, that's going to inhibit it, it's, 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 um, it's, its movement. So, and also what we found, what, what we know is that climate change is affecting um, the phenology of species. So it's affecting um, the, 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 when, when they start, you know, the emergence dates and, and, and also some species are becoming bivoltine um, as a result of climate change. And they're managing to get a second brood in, particularly down south, but this phenomenon is happening further north as well. So again, we've got here the flame shoulder. So this is this moth has increased in its abundance by 65% from 1970 to 2016. And the flight chart here shows the data from the 1970s. So again, you know, peaked early, it dropped off as a bit of maybe a partial second brood there, but you can see now that there's, you know, more clearer definition with the more recent uh, data. So this begs the question, does the moth atlas show, the results from the moth atlas show that we're heading for insect Armageddon? Um, well, in a nutshell, no, because many species are increasing and many species are colonizing the, the UK from, from Europe. So, uh, so it's not, not quite, not, not that bad, apparently. Um, so looking at humans in the environment, we've known for a long, long time that our actions as a species is having devastating effects on the uh, on our on our environment. So you had Rachel Carson's Silent Spring published in 1962. Joni Mitchell sang about you know put up a park in paved paradise and put up a parking lot in 1970. And Marvin Gaye, Mercy Mercy Me, the ecology, you know oil wasted on the sea and all the rest of it. And that was in 1971. And then again, you know, so it's a bit 1970s, but I'm a 70s kid, so. Uh, and, um, and then there's obviously Watership Down as well with the, you know, with the, the, the poor bunnies having to move out because of, of human development. So, um, so, so this, none of this is news, um, but what is news is that it, it continues to happen and it's happening at a faster rate, this degradation of the environment. And, um, and it's quite saddening really. Um, but now we've got, um, we've had David Attenborough for a long time as a sort of advocate for the environment and the natural world. And now we've got uh, Greta Thunberg as well, who's sort of empowering the younger generation. And hopefully she can really make a difference and get some, get the movement working and moving faster. But people need environmental empowerment. So Butterfly Conservation has launched um, the butterfly, uh, Be the Butterfly Effect. 
So it's uh, 10 hints and tips on what you can do to, in, to, to benefit, the, uh, benefit the environment and the planet. And it includes things like um, shopping locally, reducing your car journeys, more wildlife friendly gardening etc cetera, etc cetera. and um with the whole the whole point of the be the butterfly effect that that when a butterfly flaps its wings that flap sort of ripples out like um, a pebble being thrown on the pool and it ripples out and has further ramifications and wider ramifications just that single action and to quote uh, krishnamurti to change the world we must begin with ourselves and uh you might think that that's a little bit crazy and a bit philosophical, but let's look at the let's and, and you know, how is that achievable? When I look at this, this is a map from a, the Moth Atlas and all these people here. You've got these old look at these two again, the trailblazers here. You know, they were perhaps recording moths there and then these people recording and these people recording and these people counting moths on their patch. And all of those individual actions have um, sort of a sort of a, a cumulative effect and that has produced the atlas of Britain and Ireland's larger moths all those little individual actions have, have created this book so rather than be the butterfly effect perhaps we should be calling this the moth effect so all in all, what do we need to do? Well, we need, we've got a moth atlas, but we need to keep recording moths to keep abreast of the changes. And all of your records, it's thanks to all of the moth recorders out there and the butterfly recorders and the county recorders and everything and collate all the data and verify it. It's thanks to you guys. You submit your, you record the creatures, you submit your data, and then all of this is butterfly conservation's evidence base. And all of your records feed into conservation actions on the ground at a landscape scale, and also um, contribute to land giving advice to landowners and the highways agency uh, and things like that. So um, it's really, really, all your data is very, very important. It's not just about producing distribution maps. So there's all those uses. And there's also the research and the, the, the research and the advocacy work that, that we, that Butterfly Conservation does. It's all based on the evidence and the evidence being your records. So just to summarize the Moth Atlas, um, Moth recording is a popular pastime. It's growing in growing immensely in uh, in popularity um, and the lockdown last year really did make people stop and wake up to their their surroundings and they were recording moths and butterflies and and butterfly conservation had a 200 percent increase in queer in inquiries um, during the spring lockdown so let's hope that these people you know they, they've wet their appetite let's hope that they hang on in there and continue their their work with us um, the moth atlas is a timely account of our moths and as I said it's a treasure trove to be mined we're really scratching the surface there's so much more we can do with this data like what we've done with the butterfly data so um, you know all the scientific papers that have been produced we can do the same with the moth data and as I said can Continued recording is required because our, you know, we moths are moths are in a constant state of flux, and we need to keep abreast of those changes. So if you haven't got, oh no, no, no. So thank you to all the county moth recorders, the moth recording community, conservationists, researchers, funders, supporters, and photographers, and Moths Island, my co-authors, colleagues, um, Nature Bureau, who actually did the uh, who. who published the book and did all the design work, UKCH and Rothamsted Insect Survey. And also thank you for listening. And if you've got any questions, then um, Martin can get them, you know, can, can pose them. Um, but if your first question is, where can I get a moth atlas? Well, I would suggest that you get one from Nature Bureau because we get a much bigger cut of the uh, cut of the cover price from Nature Bureau because they're the publishers than we do from anywhere else. Um, although it is available from other booksellers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zoe, for such a wonderful and insightful uh, journey on how you put together what must have been a monumental task to deliver that, uh, that uh, book. So we have a few questions and I'm sure there'll be a few more. If you can use the chat button at the bottom of your um, screen, that would help. And I'm gonna go through them in order that they've been written. 
So Jackie Molyneux asks, does the Atlas give any idea if they're day flying or night flying moths? No, it doesn't actually. No, that's not something we included because the reason for that is that all of that other information is available out there in the amazing field guides. Um, so we didn't just want to regurgitate information that's in the field guide. So I recommend the, um, where is it? I've got it here. Uh, where, Townsend and Waring uh, field third edition guide to Britain and Ireland's moths for that kind of information. So you might have answered some of this. Nancy asked the question, do we understand the reasons for significant increases and declines? Not on a not on a species by species level and also not specifically in relation to moths. Like I said, a lot of the research that's been done that's you know that informs these biodiversity declines they the research hasn't been done specifically on moths but we can you know it's it, we can sort of extrapolate that the same factors are dry the same chemical you know the same cocktail of factors is driving biodiversity change in, in moths and you know, moth abundance and diversity and and uh, distribution Nick Hall asks, can you give us an idea of how habitat specialists have fared against the wider countryside non-specialists? <laughs> no, I'm afraid I can't. You need to speak to my colleague, one of my colleagues about that. But I think, I, I mean, I think broadly speaking, you can say that um, a lot of the habitat specialists we do have more, particularly for, particularly for butterflies. So habitat specialists in butterflies have been really well studied. You know exactly what length the grass needs to be, you know exactly when to graze and all of those different things. And their life histories are really quite well understood for butterflies. But for moths, it's, it's, it's less so. Chris Winnick asks, distributions for many are up, but abundance is drastically down. Any thoughts on how this can be reversed? <laughs> Get rid of humanity. <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> well, I think it's, um, you know, uh, well, it's, it's more, well, we need really to have more sympathetic land management um, to benefit benefit species really and um yeah more yeah i haven't really answered the question can you repeat it i've brain's gone dead distributions for many are up but abundance is drastically down how can this be reversed yeah i think that's i think we need to delve into the data more understand the life history traits of the different species and maybe we can once we find out exactly why these things are going down we will then be able to implement conservation acts uh, the conservation actions and it is quite frightening that so many species are wider countryside species you know white com formerly common and widespread species that are being affected more um, badly Okay, Jill Warwick asks, what's our brief as keen moth recorders for the next 10 years? Carry on recording. <laughs> <laughs> carry on recording, carry on sending in your data and, uh, and we will continue to, to crunch the numbers. Um, possibly, a, 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 not necessarily a question, but from Terry Crawford, I think the latter or the later autumnal phenologies were based on averages. Might that mean that moths are living later into the autumn because of milder autumns rather than flight periods starting later into the autumn? Yeah, that is, yeah, that's it because it is, it's mainly the autumnal species that are flying later. So, and the spring and the other species, the, the spring and summer ones are flying earlier. So yeah, it could just be a shift in that. And again, it's something that we need to look into and delve into deeper. Okay, another question. So I've got one here. So you've got all this data, Zoe, and you and the team. Presumably you've thought about some next steps. 
because uh, there's obviously, as you said, there's an enormous amount of data to mine. What, what are the, have you got some idea of what some of the next steps are going to be? So. Yeah, well, we've started to um, put together a, a traits database um, with UK CEH and Rothamsted, I believe. So we put a trait, getting a traits database together. So that will then enable us to look at species that um, share similar life history. So are species that overwinter as eggs faring better or worse? Um, so there's that, there's the phenology side of things. We've obviously just published the state of um, Britain's larger moths as well. Um, and some of the abundance trends from that will differ to what's in the moth atlas due to the time period of data that's been used. So yeah, there's loads that we can do. Um, it's just a case of time and resources, really. Um, We've got a new head of um, head, well, head of biological data starting um, at Butterfly Conservation, hopefully in the next few months, and he or she will end, will line manage me and Les, and Les is our database manager, and that will then free up Richard Fox's time a bit more. So Richard hopefully will get time to start doing um, some more analysis and you know, do some research in there and collaborate with, with universities and such like. Question from Nick Hall, is there a big hole in the data due to species not coming to light? And have you looked at alternatives like genetic techniques of analyzing things like bird droppings, et cetera? Yeah, well, that's the thing. So the National Moth Recording Scheme collects data, has, does have data for day flying species as well um because you know people go out and record them on their butterfly transects or record day fly moths when they're out and about whereas the rothamsted insect survey obviously all of those species are they're nocturnal and they're because they're, they're light traps they're nocturnal and they're attracted to light but no we haven't looked at that but again i think with the traits database we will be able to investigate that further another question from me Obviously, you pulled an enormous amount of data together. Were there any really big surprises, individual moths or just groups of that uh, perhaps astounded people when you saw the bigger picture? Um, nothing. Well, the thing that I think the thing that really struck me with, with it was, you know, is, is species like the lappet you know, the decline of the lappet in terms of distribution. There were also some species, actually, when you look at the distribution map, I think plain clay might have been one of them. So plain clay has disappeared virtually all over central and central England. So, and it showed the distribution pattern is very similar to that of the wool brown butterfly. So that was quite an interesting one. And I think that that would be, another avenue of, of, of interest in you know, research there. Oh. Okay. Anybody else got any questions? Nothing else coming up? No? Well, I think you're off the hook, Zoe. And, Lovely. Uh, can I thank you ever so much? Sorry about the problems getting you in at the beginning, but uh, Thank you uh, very much indeed for giving us a very insightful talk on uh, on the Atlas. I know I've spent many an hour delving into it, so uh, and uh, I'm sure many others on the talk have done so. And if they haven't, I'm sure some of them will be going out to buy it, I hope, as well. So, uh, I hope so, too. Yeah. I mean, one thing I found with it is, is when you're what I've is. It's always for me, it's always been a little bit tricky where to find all this information out. You know, you've got the field guide and then you've got a state of Britain's larger moth report, but it doesn't have all the species. And, and to have this, you know, to have this at your fingertips, it's incredible how much you do actually pick it up and refer to it. And everything, you know, most things that you need to know are, are there. It's like, ah, yes, brilliant. So, uh, yeah. So That's I guess the next, next, next thing is a, a provisional atlas of, of micro moths, but we're a little way off that yet. And uh, we'll certainly need to <laughs> get a better system in place for the, for the uh, extra verification checks that done for that. So. Good, good luck with the photographs as well. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, excellent. Well, if there's nothing else, I shall, we shall, uh, Sign off here. I shall stop the recording and uh, thank uh, Zoe once again. Thank you.
Thanks for having me. It's been really lovely to talk to you all and hopefully see you